hopefully everyone We're just going to wait for a few more minutes so everyone will join. There are around 90 people joining. So let's just wait as much as people can join and then we can start the event. Few more minutes, guys. Just for everyone to know that uh, this event is going to be recorded. So if anyone has some um, thoughts on that and don't want to be recorded, you can freely drop from the call. Um, your microphone and camera are turned off. If you want to have uh, ask question during the event, you can do them in the messages at the bottom really ask your questions and as i said we're going to wait for a few more minutes so everyone will join Hey there, hey Darko, can you hear me? Yeah, I can hear you perfectly. Um, we just awesome. gonna wait for a few more minutes, everyone will join. Um, there should be around 90 people joining, so. Oh, wow, that's yeah. a lot of people. Yeah. Awesome. It's Friday, so. I know. Yeah.
let's wait for like four more minutes and we can start. Yeah, definitely. Yeah. Okay, I I think we can start. Okay, awesome. Let me yeah. share my screen actually, so that uh, we can see our screen. And let me know once you can see my screen. Yeah. Okay. Yes, I can see your screen. Okay, thank you again, uh, Darko, and thank you everyone for joining. My name is Mohit. I'm a lead developer advocate here at Salesforce. And today, I'm really excited to present to you about how to get started with Salesforce development. So we'll take a look at a couple of slides here, uh, you know, maybe two or four slides, just to get us an understanding of what is Salesforce development uh, and what career opportunities you can have in Salesforce development. And then we'll go and do a hands-on workshop where we will uh, try to build something uh, out of Salesforce. And I'll show you what tools you need, uh, you know, how does, uh, application build on Salesforce look like, uh, and then uh, you know I'll share some resources at the end uh, where you can learn more about this. Okay, so before I begin, um, this is kind of a forward-looking statement, um, which simply means you know Salesforce is like a publicly traded company, and I work for Salesforce as an employee. So uh, you know usually we you know Salesforce releases all these new features every release like we have three releases every year and these new features come in uh, while we market these features before even these features actually land into uh, you know into our customer environment so we want you to uh, make your decisions based on only what is currently available and not something that's marketed all right having said that like what is Salesforce I think this is very important to understand um, Salesforce customer 360 is what we call is is a bunch of products okay um, like we have products for sales services marketing uh, platform slack industry cloud so many different uh, you know applications and uh, you know we integrate all of them and our whole idea of Salesforce is Salesforce is being adopted by businesses so that those businesses can be very efficient, you know, can be productive and efficient, uh, you know, and uh, serve their customers. So basically, you what you, what you want to understand from uh, from this slide is like Salesforce is designed for businesses. Okay, so Salesforce sells to businesses, and businesses use Salesforce so that they can build applications with Salesforce, and those applications are sort of used by businesses so that they can make their customers uh, uh, you know successful and serve their customers with a really good experience okay so now why do you build on salesforce i think this is really important to understand like why one should build on salesforce 
um, I think this is very core of what we do. So uh, it's really under, uh, you know, important to understand. So typically, when you build applications, now I heard that a lot of you are like, you know, in your school. Uh, you know, some of you are working, right? So uh, why do you like want to build application on Salesforce, right? So the whole idea behind why you should build applications on Salesforce is typically when you build application, it is very complex. Like when you try to build any application, you'll need a lot of things. For example, you'll need infrastructure, right? You'll need data centers. You will need you know third party certifications. You will need um, audits. And then on top of the infrastructure services, you'll start laying out your network. So in the network, you'll need HTTPS encryption, um, IP uh, login restrictions. Um, and uh, you know, on top of that, you need your applications. Like you need your developer tools. You need the compute time. Uh, you need identity. Identity is like you will need users for that app. So you'll create some kind of a identity server where the users can authenticate. You need to create API so that your apps can integrate with other system, right? Third party system. You'll need like a workflow engine a lot of times because you want to create these automations pretty pretty uh, you know easily so for all those things right building on the salesforce platform right um, makes it easy because with salesforce as you can see this three stack layer that you need for your application just boils down to one simple thing which is you have to manage your application and data and salesforce kind of manages the rest of the things for you okay um, so that's the core idea so i hope Everyone like got an understanding of why Salesforce development because you know building any applications require these three stacks. Uh, you have to maintain these three stacks, and it gets complex with Salesforce. The infrastructure and the network services are taken care of by Salesforce, so you're actually only working on the application and the data services. Okay, so now with an understanding of this, let's actually look at how to build a Salesforce app. So remember, to build a Salesforce app, we'll have uh, you know, it is three step process. So you will create your application, then you'll visualize your data, and then you'll automate the processes. And we'll take a look at that in the workshop right now. So let me switch to the workshop. So for today's workshop, uh, what I would want you all to do is go to this um, trailhead. So I don't know how many of you know trailhead, but if you don't know, just do a Google called trailhead. So Trailhead is our learning platform. So you'll go to this one. Um, you know, you're seeing this view because I'm already logged in. But if you are new, it will ask you to sign up for uh, a Trailhead, uh, you know, environment. Uh, a Trailhead is where you can learn everything about Salesforce, right? And we have different projects too on Trailhead. One of the projects that I recommend you uh, and that we'll be working on today is get started with Salesforce development. OK, so just go to the Google and say, get started with Salesforce development. It should bring the first result of that particular workshop that we will work on today. Um, so again, um, uh, you know, for those of you who joined late, um, we, we are just getting started with Salesforce development. We just uh, I did an intro intro to Salesforce. And now what I'm doing is I'm going through this workshop of how to get started with Salesforce development. Um, so let's see what are the tools that you will need. Um, and uh, Darko, um, is it correct that they have tools on their machine, or like we are just assuming that they'll install them? Uh, we assume that they will install them. Some of them they have, some of them don't. Um, okay. Yeah. Cool. Thank you. All right. So I'll talk about what are the tools that we need, and feel free to install them. They don't take much time if you don't have them. So the first tool that I would recommend you to install or get it is obviously this Trailhead Playground. So how do you get this Trailhead Playground, right? Um, is basically by signing up to the Trailhead. And once you are in this project, right? Now, I have completed this project, so I don't get this option. But here, you will see an option to say Create Trailhead Playground. So I want you to do that. Um, so that's the first thing. You will need a Trailhead Playground, okay, for this application. Um, so make sure to to have Trailhead signed up for Trailhead, um, and then uh, you know make sure to 
to have Trailhead sort of installed or not installed, like signed up and the Trailhead orgs created. Now, once your Trailhead orgs are created, you can set the password for yourself, right? Um, so there will be a tab called Get Your Login Credentials on that um, you know, environment. Uh, and there will be a button which says reset my password and you should get a password uh, on your uh, sandbox or on your org. So I can say retake it. So you see, I'm getting different orgs, right? Right. As you can see, there are different orgs here that I have, right? So this is what I was talking about. Click on this button called create trailhead playground and provide the name and create. So once you are in the playground, like for example, let me try to see if this is a trailhead playground. I'm hoping this is a trailhead playground. Uh, looks like this is not a trailhead playground. But if you have a trailhead playground, um, you will see that there is, uh, let's see. Okay, this doesn't look like a trailhead playground, but if you have trailhead playground, right, you will see a, a tab similar to uh, here, there should be a tab for you to set your passwords. So I hope you complete that. Um, that's requisite. Uh, and then the next thing that you will need is uh, what we call as Salesforce CLI. Okay. So what I would recommend you to do is is just type Salesforce CLI in Google, um, and that will give you go to this website called developer.salesforce.com/tools/slash SFDX CLI. So in this, depending on your operating system, for example, some of you might be on Windows, some of you might be on Linux, many of you are on Mac. So click on download and just download that. It's going to be a standard process. So you will download that. And once you sort of have that um, you know, command line with you, you can go to your terminal and verify whether um, you, know, you have that command line with you. So all that you need to do is say, sfdx version and it will tell you what version you have like for example i have 7.1.82.1 you see so that's the version that i have uh and yeah so so that's that's like the prerequisite is to have this salesforce cli because we will be doing some things via cli and also cli is needed for the next tool that i'm going to talk about so the next tool that we will need is Visual Studio Code. So this is very popular IDE um, or an editor. I would say Visual Studio Code is an editor more than an IDE. So in this editor, um, we will install a Salesforce extension pack. So basically go to code.visualstudio.com. Um, depending again on your operating system, uh, it will show this, like whether you want for Mac or Windows and Linux. Depending on that, make sure to install the stable version of it. Okay, so I hope everyone um, is installing and will install this tools. Now, the next thing is once you are in Visual Studio, like for example, um, say Visual Studio. So I can go here and say Visual Studio Code. So once I am in my Visual Studio Code, um, in the Visual Studio Code, look for these extensions. So here in this extension, search for Salesforce extension pack expanded. So this one, Salesforce extension pack expanded. And make sure to click on install. So because I've already installed, you can see that it just says um, like uninstall. But for you, uh, this might um, say like install. OK, so that's something to to consider is to make sure that you you install these uh, tools. OK, so just just to summarize, what are the tools we need? We definitely need you first to sign up to our Trailhead Playground because that's where we'll be building our project. So for that, we will go to trailhead.salesforce.com. Right? You will sign up. Um, once you sign up, find this badge called Get Started with Salesforce Development and open the first module, Get Ready to Build, um, and then scroll to the bottom of it. Uh, you should see something like um, Create a Playground. So click on that, provide the name of the, the playground, and say Create. It'll take some uh, three to four minutes to create your 
uh, org, and that's where we will build your, uh, our application today. Uh, and the next thing that I want to um, I want you to pay attention today is also uh, how to install some of the tools that we will use to build our application. So for the first thing that we will install is Salesforce CLI, which you can go to developer.salesforce.com slash tools slash CLI, or simply just type Salesforce CLI in your um, Google, and you should get Salesforce CLI, install them. The next thing that we want you to download is Visual Studio Code. Um, and once you kind of download the Visual Studio Code, I want you to install Salesforce Extension Pack um, and make sure that you install Salesforce Extension Pack. It's one of the very popular extensions out there um, and make sure to install them. And all of these instructions, like if you want to later follow this, right? I'm pretty sure this will be recorded. Um, so if you want to later follow uh, instructions of how to install, it's all documented in this uh, trailhead module that I'm looking here. Uh, any questions so far from anyone, Darko, that you see? Uh, there was only one question. It was about uh, access to the recording. Yes, that will be provided uh, after this, the, the event. and. Are the slides going to be available? Yeah, I will give you the these slides. I'll hand off the slides. You can distribute there. Perfect. Yeah. Feel All free, right. guys, to ask any questions into the comments, uh, yes. info messages. Yes, and uh, you know everything is on our public domain, so nothing actually sits behind the firewall. So all that you need to do is again trailhead.salesforce.com, find this project, get started with Salesforce development, uh, and just get going from there um so the next thing that we want to do is how to get started in building a salesforce app right so that is uh, that is something that uh, we will do now um so for that right um the first thing that we want to do is to create a salesforce project okay project scaffold and again instructions for that is here so today we'll be creating a project called Dream House, uh, and uh, this project basically is designed to get you started with Salesforce. So it's not uh, there's not a lot of code in this project, but it will definitely get you how to get started with Salesforce development hands on. Okay. Um, so next thing that I want to do is show you how to create a project in Salesforce. So in your Visual Studio Code, if you have installed Salesforce extension pack, all that you need to do is, I'm gonna do one thing here real quick. Command shift P and on the screen toggle mode so that you can see in what keys I'm typing. So command shift P. So when I, I type command shift P, one of the options that you will see is called SFDX create a project. So we click on that. And now what it will do is it will ask me for selecting a template. And remember that we have different forms of projects. Like if you can have an analytics project, you can have an empty project with nothing in it, or you can use a standard template. Um, generally, I recommend everyone to use standard template because it comes with a certain folder format. So let's use the standard template. And then our project name. So our project name is Dreamhouse uh, for this one. Right? Um, so we select that. Uh, and then it will ask you where you want to place this project for currently I want to place this project on my desktop but you can choose the location wherever you want on your computer um, say the folder name already exists with the selected directory okay let me change the project name so so that it doesn't um, let me say dream house uh, I'm gonna say dream house app just uh, so that you know it doesn't uh, override something that I was already working on. So let's create a project. So once you create a project, right, you will see that um, you know there's a scaffold for your project. Um, I want to take some moment to explain you what the scaffold is, etc. Um, so one of the things that you will see here is um, a Salesforce project, right, has this folder called Force App. And in that, there is a main default, right? 
So that's the, the directory structure. Now, if you're creating a Java project or, uh, you know, I don't know if you all have any familiarity with any language, but any language, uh, you know, when you are building a project, whether it be, uh, you know, any language like Python, Java, .NET, um, uh, Ruby, or whatever it is, they all have this, uh, you know, a concept where all the files actually go inside a directory. So that's why we have force app main slash default. Um, that's our directory. And in that, we have our application. So Salesforce application is made up of different components, right? So we'll have Apex classes to write our business logic. We'll have Lightning Web Components to write our UI and the front end. Um, so all of those code files go under specific folders. So, so this, this is called a project scaffold. And the, uh, the Visual Studio Code extension pack for Salesforce automatically created this for you, OK? So we have created this. Now, the next thing that we need to do, and I'm going to be flipping around with uh, uh, you know, this module. So again, the steps that we just followed is do are documented here. Next thing that we want to do is also make sure that we um, authorize, right? We authorize um, Salesforce or authorize our local IDE that we have here to Salesforce. OK, because what you will be doing is you will be creating these files in local machine. Remember, this whole project folder, where is it? Get, where did it get created? It got created in your local machine. Now, you will be frequently pushing files from your machine to Salesforce environment, uh, development environment. And then you will also be pulling some files that you create in uh, Salesforce to your local uh, uh, you know, drive or local machine or local project, whatever you want to call it, right? Um, so for that, you need to connect this project to the Salesforce environment, right? So how do you do that, right? So to do that, you will do Command Shift P and say SFDX, and then you should see something called as Authorize an org. Click on that and say it's a production. So if you're using Trailhead Playground. Uh, make sure it is called uh, production. Trailhead Playground is usually a developer edition org, and these orgs are treated just like production. But when you are working for uh, your customer, your customer may have something called a sandbox. Now, what is sandbox? Is now before putting your application to production instance, you want to build that application, test, and then only move your application to production, right? That's why there is an environment called sandbox. So you can have multiple sandboxes where you can build your application, test it. And then sort of when the application is ready, you'll move that application to production. OK. Um, so for this one, I'm going to say production. I'm going to say Macedonia. Uh, this is an alias for your org, basically. Uh, Macedonia demo. That's what I'm going to call my um, org that I'm connecting to. So this is going to take you to an org where you want to like log in. OK. Um, let me see if I have a org that I can use for this. Let me use the same org that I have here. So I'll use the same org. Again, this he here, it should be the playground username. So remember, you signed up for the playground username, right? Um, in your um, environment, right? Um, you signed up for playground username and playground password. Um, now, what I want you to do is use that username and password. I'm just going to log in. So once you say login, it will let you log into the Salesforce environment. Um, and if you actually come back to your Visual Studio Code, it should say that it has authorized. So you see, it said SFDX authorization successfully completed. So now your project, like this project, is connected to this environment of Salesforce that you created from the trailhead. So now. I can simply click on this um, thing. And when I click on this, it will basically uh, open the org. So next time, you don't have to remember the org credentials, right? This project will always be there on your machine. So as soon as you open in Visual Studio Code, you will see this icon. And you click on that. And that will open up uh, this thing for you. So that's like our first, I think that is our first uh, thing if you have gotten um, here now one there's one more thing that we want to do here right so the other thing that we want to do here or I want to show you is uh, 
these files that we will create, we want certain consistency, right? We want to format them with Prettier. Prettier is like a, a plugin or a tool that got installed. So you see this package.json, right? So any of you familiar with Node.js project, maybe many of you. So if you're familiar with Node.js project, right? Salesforce uh, development tools is a Node.js uh, uh, compatible or let's not say Node.js compatible, but it is built using Node.js, right? So Salesforce development tools uses Node.js to format, lint your code, et cetera. So as you can see, there is a package.json here, right? And if you see, if it says this little red icon. So let's actually fix it. So one thing you will note is there is something called as terminal, okay, in your Visual Studio code where you can access the terminal. You can also say command shift P and then say terminal. Okay, like you can say, uh, you know, I think it's called terminal. Create a new terminal. If you say this, it will create a new terminal, right? Um, also, if you are on Mac, there is this thing called control, and uh, there's an apostrophe key. If you press that, that will be done. Let me see if I can on the toggle screen mode again. Um, okay, let's see. So I can, you see? So when I press this key, right? I can get the terminal here. So in this terminal, right, I'll type in npm install, right? I want to type in npm install so that it actually installs all of the npm um, that is found in the dev dependencies here so that we have uh, tools like Prettier that we can use. So that's something to do uh, is make sure that you're installing uh, npm install on your project. And that, that might be the last step for setting up your tools. It's going to take some time to get all the node modules from uh, internet. Um, so as you can see, all the node modules are installed. Um, now, to make this error go away, just to command shift P and say um, window reload. So now you will see that that error will go away. You see this. It takes some time for this to get activated. So. Um, Ignore this. Now you can see, you know, there's this thing called Prettier, which says like, uh, you know, just ignore this warning because there's some orgs. There are more orgs in my setup. You might not get all of those warnings, but you will see that Prettier got installed and everything is successful. And now we are connected to the environment where we want to work on this project. Uh, any questions so far, Darko? Uh, not at the moment. Um... I think people are shy. Uh, remember, guys, there are no stupid questions, so you can ask anything you want. Absolutely, there's nothing stupid questions here, and uh, you know, feel free to ask anything. You know, nothing is uh, everything here. What I'm teaching is very fundamental, and um, you know, you might have a very simple question. So feel free to come, uh, you know, off chat or use that chat uh, on the Google Meet up here, and uh, please feel free to ask your questions. And also tell me if my pace is pretty fast or you know you're able to follow me um, we have we have one question trying to create the project but getting an error what's the error yeah uh if you could tell me what's the error i could Dream, dreamhouse the folder is invalid the folder is invalid okay probably so the folder is not created yes maybe it's some problem with your machine right uh, make sure you have access to create folders on your machine. And also make sure when you are choosing the folder where this project uh, is getting um, sort of stored in your machine, make sure to, to choose a folder that you have access to. Like, for example, not all of the drives in your, uh, especially when you're on Windows, right? Not all of the drives you can modify. Um, so don't try to put it in your root directory of the of your machine. Just try to put it in somewhere like desktop or uh, uh, usually a D drive or something on your uh, Windows. Yeah. Okay. Cool. We sorry to interrupt you. We have another question. Um, uh, we we have a thank you for uh, the previous question, and then we have another one. Is, is all of the code shown Dreamforce app previously created by you, or does 
it all appear once we install the Salesforce extension into the Visual Studio code? That's a great question. Again, this is really awesome question. So we have not created any code, as you can see. Um, but yeah, I mean, the especially these uh, files and some things that you see, uh, right? They are all automatically created. It's it's not because of the extension per se, right? Um, so this extension, right? Salesforce extension pack got installed. So when we said SFDX create project, it automatically scaffolded the whole project for me. And yes, it created these files for you. Again, this has no code in it, but yes, it has some code to get your environment up and running. Um, also, it gave you a project structure of uh, a sample structure. So there are directories, but as you can see, they don't have any files in them, except for these linting files, which is tooling specific. Uh, but other than that, there are no files in it to begin with. I hope that answers the question. All right, let's uh, let's move on, right? Let's move on. This is exciting. We got uh, we got our environment set up, done, right? Um, this is all the environment setup you need. Um, again, uh, it might take you some more time if you're running into issues and stuff, but uh, uh, feel free to like you know Google them. Most of the issues are on Google, um, and yeah, these instructions are also written in this one. So once you kind of authorize, right, you should be able to like on those points directly by verifying them on on this so okay so the next step is very interesting which is creating a data model using clicks right this is very very interesting so when you create applications on salesforce right so this is the slide that i always show building a salesforce application there are so many things that you need to do right but in reality right you can see that this slide says you have apps you have tabs you have objects you have these data you know user interface security but the real power of salesforce is you can just click and point and do a lot of the stuff right so uh, i don't know how many of you created actual databases but when you're creating actual databases you program them you write you know if you had taken a class like pl sql in your uh, academy uh, or in your school, you'll see that you know it has programs to write uh, to create these tables, right? So that aspect of it is taken care of by Salesforce platform. So let's actually see how to create um, uh, schemas in Salesforce and what schemas are, right? So for example, um, so for this project, right, we'll create a, a object called house, basically, and in that house object, we will put some fields, we'll put some data. Um, so in Salesforce, right, if you actually go to the setup menu, so if you have access to the Salesforce right from Trailhead, click on the setup, and in this setup, go to this object manager. And see, there are so many objects that are available out of the box. So remember, Salesforce is also a tool, a CRM tool, right? So a CRM tool, um, you need certain objects to function. And again, Salesforce also used for service purposes, so you need certain objects. So you will see a bunch of standard objects. Um, so a Salesforce application typically involves using these standard objects, and also for the functionality that you need to extend, you build custom objects too. So what are objects? Think of objects as tables in your so you, so any application requires a database. Okay, so a database has tables. And in that table, the data sits as rows. And uh, you know, so you create the columns. So for example, I'm creating a house object. What do I need in that house object, right? I need, um, uh, you know, I need to store the name of the house object. I need to know the address of the house object. I need to know like how many bedrooms that object, that house has. Where is that house located, right? So all these information I need to store. So those properties, like the ones that I talked about, name, address, these are our columns in database and in salesforce we call them fields while house itself is an object in salesforce uh, typically in software engineering right you would call them as tables so you have tables then the tables will have uh, you know columns and then the data sits as rows pretty simple to understand right think of it as an excel right so in excel you have rows that's your data and you have columns right the columns are your fields so in Salesforce, you can map that rows and the columns 
to uh, object, right? So you create an object. Now to create an object, there is this object manager called create, and you can click on custom object. And this is a simple drag and drop, uh, not drag and drop, I would say, but a click and point tool where you can just fill in the name of the objects and then you can start creating fields and then you can link these objects, right? For example, every house will have a broker, let's say. And that broker could be a different object or it could be a user object in Salesforce that I want to link to. So that's called relationships. We'll not deep dive into relationship. There's a trailhead module to teach you. Uh, since this is an introductory class, I'm not going to get into all those nitty gritty details. But you know, typically, any object or any tables that you create, you have to interlink them based on how you want to store your data. That's called relationship. In Salesforce, there are multiple ways to relate, like master detail and lookup. Um, and you can learn more about it in Trailhead. But for this application, right, what I've done is I've simplified creating that table. So there is something called create object from spreadsheet. So what this does is you can provide uh, the spreadsheet and it will automatically create the object and the fields for you. So that's the power of custom object from spreadsheet. So what I've done is I've given you a spreadsheet in this trailhead module. So what you can do here is you can go to um, you can go to this spreadsheet and download this. So it's called House. I've just downloaded the spreadsheet. Um, so once I download that spreadsheet, what I can do is I can. So this is like a very short way to create objects, you know. Um, so I'm gonna say log into Salesforce again. Just provide the credentials. Um, it's going to ask for some permissions. You say allow them. And then you're going to say, I want to provide that Excel sheet. Um, I'm going to provide that house Excel sheet, right? I'll make sure. So you see, um, so let's look at that sheet, right? Let's look at that house sheet, what it had. So house sheet, right, is a CSV. Uh, you can open this in Excel. I don't think this is the right uh, way to view, right? Let me see if I can put this online on something. Online CSV viewer. Yeah, let me choose this file. All right, so you can see this is the CSV, right? So what it has, it has the name of the house address of the house, the state, the city, the zip code, the, the number of beds and bathrooms that this uh, house has, the price of this house, and then the images of this house, OK? So those are some of the data, actually, that is sitting um, inside the specific object. So as you can see, this is the data. And then this one, these are called fields, OK? So we want an object called house, and then we want all these fields to be created. So what you can do in this module um, or in this what was the spreadsheet that I was creating for uh, this one, object creator. So here it will tell you the object name. Um, yeah, so here you can say it automatically also maps the data types for it, for it automatically. So you don't have to worry about it. You can also just preview the data like this. This is how the data will look like. Um, yeah, it's a export name field maps to name field. Let's uh, let's map the name field of the object here. Um, next, now you can change this. This is just called house. Change the name. There are some advanced settings, like for example. There are certain things that can get enabled automatically, and you can control them. And then you say Finish. So now this is creating object behind the scenes for me. So it will create the object for me. Um, it will also create the layouts. Um, and we'll see. We can view this in Salesforce now. Uh, and also, we will be able to um, basically uh see the data so as you can see it automatically created this object for us so i should be able to view them now uh let's see if i can view this data that's already created in salesforce so i can say house you can see house i'm able to access the tab uh, i can say all the records 
and you can see all the data that was there in this Excel or CSV file is now sitting in Salesforce. So now I can click on this house. You know, I can see, I can even look at its picture. Um, you know, a lot of stuff, right? Um, so as you can see, uh, you know, I was quickly able to have a system working where, you know, there's an object and I can import all the data into Salesforce. And now I can see that data within Salesforce. So this is how you create objects. So if you actually go to the object manager now and look at house, you can click on here. And now if you go to fields and relationship, you can see all the fields got automatically created, right? So this was one of the way to automatically create, but if you want, you can manually create too by clicking on that custom object and then adding the object. It's gonna take some clicks for you to create them, but uh, you know, I would say, it's going to take some more clicks for you to create these, but it should be possible um, just by clicks. I wanted to save some time, so I directly said, uh, you know, create it from the spreadsheet. Uh, any questions so far before we move ahead? Yeah, um, there was a question about can we use our own database? Uh, in Salesforce, that's a very, very good question, right? Uh, we don't recommend you to use your own database and also it's not possible in the salesforce core application to use any database any database that you like the reason for that is uh, there's a lot of security stuff that comes out of the box once you create objects and there are so many other things that comes out of box in salesforce like the you know the view that i showed you um, there is a tab that got created there's an app that you can create and everything is sort of interlinked so we don't there's there's no way that you can create um how you can use your own databases we don't recommend you have to use salesforce now if you want to bring data from that database into salesforce there are different ways you can expose an api you can call from salesforce and then uh, you know you can also bring this data as an external services there's something called as external services to bring that data or uh, you know salesforce connect so there are difficult way different sorry not difficult different ways to show that data in salesforce but really you know once you bring the data in salesforce that's where the real power is because once you have data in salesforce you can write different automations that i'll show you you can write flows there are so many other products that get linked to it that we don't um uh, you know allow you to use external data like definitely you can bring those external data integrate with salesforce but to get all the advantages, you still need your data in Salesforce. And we manage the database for you, so you don't have to worry about creating your own database. I hope that answers. All right, so moving on, right? Moving on, so um, let's Sorry, move on. Kit, I, I have one question. Yes. What is that schema builder there that I saw previously? That's a great question. Schema builder. So when you click on the schema builder, right? Schema builder is also one way to uh, like um, find out relationship between objects. Like for example, I can have account and then I can have say contact. And these are standard objects that comes with Salesforce, right? So as you can see, it shows you, you can view the schema, right? Like you can see what are the fields that are there. You can see how these two objects are linked to um again they are linked via the the lookup relationship as you can see what are the fields that are there and then you can do a lot of things like for example you can directly view that object directly from here you can view its page layout um uh, and i think you can also create object from here that's something like for example if you want to create a new object you just drag and drop and from here you can start creating the object you can even create fields by just dragging and dropping. It's basically a visual tool to build your data model instead of like clicking and uh, you know doing multiple clicks. Does that answer your question, Darko? Yeah, there is a, a follow-up question on my question. Is it like ER diagrams in a DBMS like or a Yes. That's 100% right, almost like that. You can think of it like that. Yes, it is generating an ERD for you out of the box. Only thing that I wish this had was a uh, you know, way for me to export this. Uh, you have to screenshot today 
uh, but there's no way to export this uh, outside Salesforce um, through PDF or something. Maybe there is an app on App Exchange for that. Yes, yes, absolutely. App on App Exchange. And that's something that I want to talk about at the end is like Salesforce. So once you build any application on Salesforce, like this application that I'm building, you can put it on App Exchange and sell it. Um, so you can go to appexchange.salesforce.com uh, and you will see there's lots of application that people sell, right? Um, so you can sell it and any customer who is using Salesforce can install them. Think of Salesforce like an Apple uh, phone or an Android phone and think of that App Exchange as an Apple store or an Android store from where you can buy multiple apps. Okay, cool. Uh, I, any other questions before we move? Yeah, no, so far we're good. Okay, great. Thank you. So the next thing that we want to do is create an app. So till now, what we have done is we've created this thing, right? Um, uh, also, other thing that I forgot to tell you is when this is getting created, right? Uh, Salesforce, right? You will have users. So there's a user table that sits. Um, that's where you say, okay, how many users are there in your system? Like, for example, I can say users and click on users. And uh, currently, I'm the only user with an admin, but there are certain other users. So you can add users. Those users can log into your system, right? Uh, and then for that users, you define what we call it as profile, OK? Uh, so for example, system administrator is a profile. So profile define access, right? So for example, for the house object here, um, you can see that for all the fields, I have said, OK, I want ability to read the field. I want ability to edit the field, except for like last modified date or I think created by, because these two dates are controlled by Salesforce, so we don't allow you to edit them for auditability. Um, so the idea is that you can create your own profile, like I can create my own profile. Uh, like for example, I can say, I want to create my own profile here, right? So I can create my own profile, provide the license, right? Uh, and the profile name, and then I can control the access. Like I can say, okay, I want this object access to this specific person. I want only these fields to be accessible, right? Um, so that's something that is possible. Think of it as a matrix, matrix, right? Where you can create these users, assign them different profiles, and then control what they can see, what they cannot see, what you want to do, what you want to allow those users to do in their apps, right? That's something I forgot to do, but this module actually talks about it. So make sure to go look at it, right? Uh, the other thing that I want to talk about is creating an app. So how do we create an app, right? So currently, you see, I had to search for this is a sales app, right? So there are so many bunch of other applications like sales, marketing, community, content, right? Um, and then, um, uh, you know, LWC recipes is one of the apps that I've installed from our sample gallery that I'll talk to you soon. But there are so many apps. But now, for my dream house, I want my own application. So how do we do that? So we go to setup and then go to app manager. Just like you have object manager for objects, there is app manager. So you click on that and then say new lighting app, right? Uh, and I give you the instructions of what needs to go in there in that form. Uh, basically, you can say dream house. Uh, there's, an, there's a nice little logo too that you can download. So let me download this logo. You can download this logo and save to your computer file. Um, and then upload that logo. And then um, it's uploading. Then you can say next. Uh, let's say standard navigation next. Uh, you can add utility items if you want but for now i want to add the stab house maybe i want to add a few more things like reports uh, reports are analytics actually so you can do some anim analytics also on the data so once you have the data you can do some reporting charting uh what are the other things that i ask you to drag and drop so home reports dashboards i think could be dashboards again a way to visualize so these things comes out of the box so next, and you can select the profile. For the time being, I'm going to say system admin profile, save and finish. Right? So now we save and finish. 
So now we have created the application. So now you can see that application here. So if I search for Dream House, I should see this application with this logo, and I can click on them. And I can see that house object. Um, and then there is this thing called reports, where you can see some reports and dashboards. So these are standard. Again, these come standard out of the box. Um, now, all of this that you saw today, right? like building these data model, creating these application that we just created, configuring the profiles, right? There is this tab that got automatically created that I did not talk about. And also, when you click on something, you are viewing these fields. Those things are also uh, easily can be changed. Like, for example, this whole page can be changed. You know, And we will see an example of how to do that. Like, for example, I can drag and drop things here. right? Um, I can um, you know, change the components here. Um, and as I said, there is a page layout that comes with it. So for example, this is a page layout where I can say, uh, you know, let's say I want um, you know, price field to go on the left. I can do that. So I can go here and say, I want price field on the left. I want the picture field to go here. I can save this, right? I can save this. And you can instantly see that it's automatically sort of reflected in your application. Uh, I have to refresh the cache. So sometimes what happens is uh, this is a very common thing you will learn in Salesforce is to refresh the cache. Let's see. Uh, okay, okay. I'm going to do this. Uh, I'm uh, gonna go here and say empty cache hard reload. So now it will show up. Oh, it did not. It still did not. Okay. Sometimes the page layout changes takes some time. Uh, let's see if the changes were saved. Okay. It seems like the pages were saved. Okay, make sure that the page layout is assigned correctly. So you can also assign the page layouts, right? So it seems like we have only one layout, but you know you can have multiple layouts. Again, every profile can have its own variations of what fields that you want to see. Uh, we should see this pretty. Okay, there's something wrong with that. Let's see. Sometimes it takes some time. Again, as I said. You know, it caches heavily, especially the page layout. So you see, it is actually getting reflected here. Maybe I just save this. Let me assign this to this. Yep. All right, no worries. So uh, it will reflect. It's it's just it takes time. It takes time. Yeah, it takes. It can take up to 15 minutes, is what I've heard. Um, I mean, yeah. There you go. It's still not showing up. OK, that's fine. Um, you know, it, it will definitely reflect after some time. Maybe if I open this you know, um, incognito window, it will show up. Uh, but uh, let's move on. So, so, so far, right, um, as you can see, we were able to do a lot of things by clicks, right? I was able to click, point, create. These UIs have fields, have them show up in my layout. I didn't have to build anything you know, through the code. right? Uh, but imagine you want now this application that you've created to move to a different environment. right? Let's say you had another Salesforce org and you want to move them. Right? And also, you want to take a look at like what are the things that got created behind the scene. So anything that in Salesforce we configure, it gets stored in Salesforce as XML packet, and we call that as metadata. Okay, so metadata is something that uh, anything that you do in Salesforce gets stored as XML packets called metadata, and you can retrieve that metadata and store it locally. So I don't want this application to just exist within this Salesforce org because tomorrow, if I lose this Salesforce org, right, what will happen, right? Um, I don't have access to anything that I just built, right? So you need to store that, version it. Like imagine there are five to six people who are actually working with you, 
on uh, for this application so how do you collaborate right how do you know that that person added a specific field right so and so for that you have to store this in a version control like git just like any other project right so to do that we provide metadata so i'll show you how to retrieve metadata so whatever you have created so far right could be easily retrieved using what we call it as org browser okay so if you if you look at here there's something called as org browser so click on that and that will show all the metadata that got created so for example we created some objects right so we can click on this and you will find that there is a house object that got created uh there you go so there's a house object so i can click on this one and it is actually retrieving that source uh, from uh, my salesforce environment so now within my local machine or within my IDE, i can go here and see that i have this house object right so this is my house object it has it has these many fields that got created it has a layout it has this uh nice little list view that you saw right the list view that i was looking this one um so i was looking at uh, the specific list view right this is called list view all records so you see all these columns so you can see that information here right um so you can see you can retrieve right so there are so many other metadata that got created behind the scenes when we were doing this whole setup and now i want to show you how you can retrieve all of them um so one way is obviously org browser like if you have to remember you know when you're working with org browser you have to remember that okay i created maybe i created these object i want to pull that maybe i created these layouts i want to pull them right so you have to remember it uh, while there is one one org or scratch org so in salesforce there are multiple ways to do the development so what i'm showing is how to work with a developer edition org or a trailhead playground but you can create a scratch org environment and that has different cli commands where you don't have to remember what you created in the org think of it like you just build your application and you run a command and it will automatically get you everything that you built so that's the use of scratch org again i don't want to dig into the scratch org concept because it might be overwhelming uh, but if you actually get employed as salesforce developer in ecosystem you will come across these different orgs like sandboxes scratch orgs and a lot of the development depends on your architecture like an architect might decide that okay we're going to be using sandbox for our development right so sandboxes with a source tracking will have that feature of uh, what i was just talking about and also scratch orgs have that feature where everything gets tracked whatever you're doing and you don't have to remember that okay i created this object i created this and you can pull in the metadata but for this one we are using trailhead playground which doesn't have that feature so i'll just copy everything so i know that i created an application i know that i created this tab i know that i created this layout right i already have the object sort of pulled in right so so what i pulled in is just the object but i want to retrieve other metadata too and the way you can do it is by using the command line so on the command line there is this thing called sfdx sfdx is like the uh, the command for source retrieve and then i can say okay i want to retrieve all of this so i say enter now it's retrieving so you see it retrieved all the metadata so now you can see the application that i just created dreamhouse app it's there its logo is there uh its form factor and other things that we configure like the tabs that this application has remember we had house tabs reports dashboards it's all there uh, we also have layouts right uh, like there is this house layout remember we were modifying certain fields in there like for example uh, you know we pushed certain fields like price and the picture so you can see the two column layout here so everything that you did is now available as an xml packet now i want to stop at this point uh, and see if there are any questions before we kind of move into more interesting stuff yeah i think peter asked a question is this newly created app automatically added to the visual studio code environment since we already authorized it with the playground yes so yes so we authorized with the playground yes so um the metadata you still need to be pulling right so you need to execute these commands to pull that metadata but yeah it will be automatically added to the right folder so for example when i pull the application it know that it has to go under the application folder 
uh, it knows when I pull the layouts, it knew that it has to go under layouts. Similarly, for objects, it knows that it has to create a folder directly called house. Uh, yeah. That was the only question we have so far. Perfect. All right, so moving on. So that should complete your second module, um, create data model using clicks. Um, just you know, feel free to uh, submit it, and you will get 100 points. Um, we have gamified this. Um, so yeah, so that is the second module. Basically, the idea that I want to tell you here is there are so many things in Salesforce that you can do out of the box without even coding. And that is the power of Salesforce. As I said, you're not building a SQL table or anything. You just click and point. But still, there is this power of code, right, where you can extract all of these as metadata and store it in your source control uh, and handle just like a normal project. OK? All right, next we'll move on to our second or the third module where I want to teach you how to write business logic in Salesforce. So what is a business logic, right? How many of you have programming experience? I'm, I'm hoping some of you have some sort of programming experience, but if you, if you don't have, don't worry. Like Salesforce, like Apex was the first programming language that I properly learned. Um, and uh, Apex is pretty similar to Java. So if you have Java experience, you'll pretty much be familiar with how Apex runs. Again, I have very short amount of time, so I won't be going into the language fundamentals of okay how to learn Apex and stuff. There is already a lot of content on Trailhead where you can learn about Apex, how to get started with Apex, uh, and how to learn these programming concepts, right? But for time being, I'm going to build a Apex class. So what is Apex, right? Apex is like a business logic or a code that you can build, and then you can invoke that code, right? from different parts of the application. Like, for example, in this case, I'm just building a simple uh, house service, which basically I can query all the records that I just saw, right, uh, via the code. And then I can call this via the triggers or via a user interface that I'll build it up, right? So for time being, right, we will um, try to build this specific Apex. So to build Apex, right, you will go into the Apex folder and say class and say create apex class so here you will say house service so that's the name of my class so click on that it'll automatically create you a scaffolded code file like this right so this is like your class definition this is your constructor in this case we might not need constructor because um, this class is something that we are not instantiating uh, but then i'm going to simply copy paste for the time being because um, i don't want a live code uh because you know you are all very new to salesforce and uh, uh you know i want to spend more time on teaching you how to build rather than you know like why also like teaching you the language construct because that's something i'll leave up to you right so this is a small piece of code house service and this is a small method okay what it is doing is it is fetching all the houses right like at least 10 houses and then it is returning so that's all it is doing so I can sorry. So I can call this now by saying house service dot get records. So how do I test this, right? So I have this code, and this is called Sockle queries. Okay, Sockle queries are query language of Salesforce. Okay, um, so in Salesforce, this is very common, like Sockle queries. Um, and note that um, you know. So for example. Um, if you have learned SQL, this is very, very similar to that. This is a query language. So within Apex, you have access to this query language where you can fetch data from, OK? So here, how do I test this? Like, how do I see if this is working or not? For that, we can create a script file here in our script folder and say Apex. And I'm going to say, uh, you know, let me say how service test.apex. So you can, so first we need to save this, okay? So once we save this, so we'll have to save this. So you'll see this, deploy this source to org. So you'll click that. So now this is gonna push this code to Salesforce. Again, I just want to see, this. what this code does is it is a, a class. It has a static method. So any Apex class has methods. Methods is where you write the functionality. 
So what this is doing is it's trying to fetch all the houses from the object called house. So we've written something called a Sockle query. And then we are returning that query. So as you can see, this is a list. So it is returning all the list of houses. So to test this, right, all that you need to do is you say house service dot get records, right? Um, so when you do this, right, so there's this code icon that is called execute anonymous. So when you click on that, it will execute that code. And I can expand this and show you that it actually got executed. So it says it's executed, but we are not able to see the result. So to see the result or print it, you can say system dot debug. It's pretty similar to uh, you know print statement in other languages. The so system dot debug is how you see in your debug logs what's going on. So now you can see that it is able to query in my debug. I can see it's able to query all these information, right? So this is a simple Apex class that I wrote to show you how to write Apex and how you can like, so when you work for your client or your uh, businesses, right, you will see lots of Apex classes that they have created because this is where you write the business logic, right? You write them, you basically call them, uh, and then you can use this in your UI services or through the triggers and whatnot. So any questions so far, like what is Apex? I, I know this is like very quick. So you might, you guys might have lots of question around what is Apex and how to like build it, et cetera, et cetera. But again, the aim is not to go detail into it. I just want to show you how to create a simple Apex class, how to debug it. And, um, you know, there's a lot of modules already on Trailhead. If you search for where you can learn this language. And this is going to be the important part of your development journey is to know not only those local tools but also no apex and know when to use apex right apex is used to enhance the functionality and the features now this class that i've created i'm going to reuse this class in the next thing that i'm going to build so i'm going to now create an lwc component and you will see that i will need to make i'll make use of this class any questions so far darko from the team yeah uh there are a couple Okay. So uh, one is, do we need to do Apex to begin with Lightning Web Components, or we can pick any of them first? Uh, I would say you can pick any of them first, but um, at some point, right, you will realize that um, you know you will need some Apex uh, skill. So think of Salesforce as a full stack development. So you will need to learn. You, you will need to learn both LWC and Apex. And you can start with the LWC. There's no harm in it. It depends on your personal preference. Like for me, I'm a backend developer to begin with. So I loved Apex and I started working on Apex and I mastered that. And then I went to the front end like LWC. But I can easily see that if somebody is a front end developer, they might already have familiarity with HTML, JavaScript, CSS. And for them, I easily see that. Uh, you know, they might just be familiar with, uh, you know, or more comfortable with JavaScript as a language. And then um, what they can do is they can simply use Lightning Web Components and learn them, and then probably move on to the backend language. Thank you. Uh, so we have another one. Uh, can we use some other language instead of this Apex? That's a very good question. So what we are building today is on Salesforce core platform. So on the Salesforce core platform today, Apex and LWC are the popular languages. And that's the full. So if you want to become a developer, you absolutely need to know. Now, you will soon realize that with Apex, there's only like, you know, if you are working for an enterprise clients, Apex, like at some point, you will see that, uh, you know, you have to learn the best practices of Apex and all of the good stuff that comes. But still, there might be some processes and some things that you can't do it with Apex. And we have a whole new offering called Functions. Uh, Functions is, again, uh, another um, uh, you know, service that we provide at Salesforce. And that Functions, you can write in a language of your choice. Like uh, currently, uh, three languages are supported, like Java, JavaScript, and uh, Python. Um, so you can use that uh there but yeah if you're working on salesforce core which i'm which is something that i'm showing today it'll be only apex and lwc thank you there is another one uh is try catch block required in all classes yes yeah, so try catch is actually um 
uh, absolutely i would say you need to handle error um, to some extent in this case we need it because if the service fails we want to throw an error of a specific format for example you can see here like ara handled is what we are using um, we need to um, yeah so try catch is required again for different things now there might be things where you might do things differently for example triggers triggers is where you can um, so you don't want to throw an exception but you want to handle it in a user friendly way so so yeah i mean uh, to handle exceptions, one of the ways is try and catch and catch that exception and then throw it, a user-friendly error message. Um, so yeah, error handling is something that's important. It's a good practice. Yeah, it's a best practice, yeah. Yeah. So there's a, a one last question, as I see. Uh, given the trend towards low code in Salesforce, can you give us some common examples of why a company would need to hire a developer rather than just ask an admin to create a no code flow yes that's a great question right no code flow um again yes you know a company can hire an admin and get um their things working right but typically what we have seen from our experience like i've worked on salesforce for like 10 12 years now as as a developer before i became a developer advocate and sort of teach now so what i've seen from my experience is you will see like admins are part of that, um, but you will see that sooner or later your customers will have requirements where it will, you will, they will need to actually tap into the code, especially when you're working for very big enterprises, they have lots of code in them. So, um, I mean, admins and stuff is really good, great, it works to some extent, but when you are trying to customize and build custom applications, like we have businesses built on Salesforce, like for example, App Exchange ISV companies, they have their entire app on Salesforce, right? And you know, it is heavy developer, heavy code. So yeah, absolutely. I mean, they all definitely need developers too. And we have seen that, uh, you know, maybe um, for enterprise clients, you know, it depends on type of business they have, but most of them require uh, a lot of developers. So. Again, there's a scarcity of people who know Salesforce development, and Salesforce development is something that definitely, um, you know, just the low code is not enough. You'll still need to know code because with the code you can be a little more flexible and, um, you know, create you know, basically you can um, build apps. Let's yeah. put it this way. What what I can add to that is like uh, even flows uh, when you build a complex logic, uh, sometimes you need to include code in the flow uh, because uh, there are limitation at some point, and for that reason, like the flow will not be enough, uh, and that's why you will probably need uh, a developer to build that apex. Yes, yeah, and you know honestly, um, as Darko was saying, like these low code tools. Um, they are good for simple requirements, but once your requirements like go a little complex, right? You'll definitely be uh, extending the platform capabilities, and Apex is one way to extend them and custom code the logic. All right, I'll move on because I'm running out of the time here, real quick. So the next thing that we want to do, and this should complete your third module. Uh, I strongly recommend that you go through. And also, one of the things you'll notice is we have different resources when you scroll to the bottom of this exercises to help you learn certain things. Like for example, Apex Triggers is a very big part of Salesforce development. And that's why there's a module called Apex Triggers that you can click, you know, so it'll take you to another module where you can learn about Apex Triggers and how to write efficient triggers, right? Um, building your Apex coding skills, like this is for all beginners, you know, it teaches you object-oriented programming, it teaches you SOCO uh, that I was not able to go through. But yeah, uh, there's a lot of things that you can use, okay? Um, make use of these resources. Again, it's for all the modules that we have gone through so far. All right, so the last piece of the puzzle of becoming a Salesforce developer, and this is also a very big part of it, is customizing the user interface, right? So for example, so let me add, um, let's say I want to add, so first thing that I will do is I'll add the home page there because we are building a component for home page. So, so again, app manager, and this click path is gonna take you some time. Um, I'm actually being able to navigate pretty quickly because, you know, again, um, I have some experience working with Salesforce, but for you, it might be overwhelming to click all these tabs and navigate through, but once 
once you start doing it for some time, you'll get used to it. So I want to add a home page. All right, so the next thing that I want to talk about is um, how to customize user interfaces. So for example, this is our home page. It's pretty blank at this point. And I want to build my own component and customize it. So I, I already gave you some hints. Like what you can do is there is this, when you edit this page, you can see everything as a component and you can drag and drop things here, right? Like for example, I can drag, let's say I want, uh, you know, a certain things, like I want uh, a list view. These are all standard components. So I can just say, I want some list views here, right? Uh, let's say I want uh, account list view. I can say account list view here. So you can see some data um, that's coming, right? Um, something like this, right? So you get the idea, like you have different components and you can drag and drop them to create this user interface for your uh, customers, right? Uh, but that's not the point that I want to make uh, today. What I want to make um, or I want to convey is you can also build components. So you see there are 67 custom components and we're going to build one more. So you can build that custom component too using code and then your customers can drag and drop it or your admins can do it. Um, the other thing is you can also install some of these components from App Exchange. That means as a developer, you can build something and put it on an App Exchange and then have customers sort of install it. Okay. Um, so that's the capability. So today we're going to build an LWC component. And what that component is going to do is it's going to show all the housing that we have in a map. Okay, and I'll show you how to like sort of build them. So the first thing we'll need to do is just like we went to Apex classes to build Apex, we'll go to LWC and I'll say create lighting web component. I think it's called housing map. So, so let's name that lighting component. We call it as housing map. Map. Save it, right? We saved it, and as you can see, it scaffolded something for us, like uh, a template file where you can put the HTML, uh, a JavaScript file where you can write the logic and connect HTML, uh, the front end and the back end also. Like you can import here, you can import a server wire and connect to the server. Uh, that is the Salesforce Apex classes, uh, or you know there are wire adapters by which you can just directly access Salesforce data without using sales without using apex and then finally you can configure here like where exactly you want this lighting component to be available there are so many different interfaces in salesforce where you can have these components like for example the one that i'm building it for home page but you can have a component let's say on a detail page too like i can customize this too so you can build a uh, component for this um so there are various interfaces like for detail you know, and then there is this whole product called Experience Cloud, <laughs> where you can build, uh, uh, you know, experiences like sites, like a website, right? So you can just do all those using Lighting Web Components, and you can build your Lighting Component for that too, right? And then you can also create your own tabs and pages too. Like for example, um, you know, I can go to Setup, and I can go to my uh, Lab. We call it as Lab, which means Lighting App Builder. So you can click on Lighting App Builder here, and then you can say New, uh, and you can build your own page, like a app page. Uh, so once you build your app page, um, what you can do is you can drag and drop components. So you can you can choose what layout you want, um, and then you can drag and drop. Okay. So there are multiple ways again uh, to customize. Today we are building something for the home page here. Okay. So again, I'm not going to get into the depth of the code um how to build it but I'll, I'll show you something so for example today we're going to use um a base component library so to make you easily build so you you're not building html from the scratch like gone are those days when people used to build everything from the scratch now you can build it still if you want to like if there is something that is not provided in this library but we have tons of component as you can see like including accordion uh, you know, lots of these base components for you so that you can just use these examples. And these have already a lot of functionality baked for you. So we have abstracted the complexity for you so that you can 
use these and build your application, right? So I'm going to make use of this map component today because you know I don't have to write code. As you can see, it's like just simple one line markup. And then I have to handle the functionality in the JavaScript, and my work is done, right? Um, so I'm going to simply copy paste this, and I'm going to explain as I copy paste this. Um, so this one, right? Um, again, you can explore all of these components from this specific URL. But here I'm using a simple card, writing card, which is like a, it gives you a card layout, which we will see. It has a map basically, and the map asks you that you provide the map markers, and these markers should come from the JavaScript. So we move on to our JavaScript file. And again, just in the interest of the time, I'm going to be copy pasting certain things. Um, so here, right, what it is doing is it is calling that housing service. So as you can see, uh, so this is how we write Lightning Web Components. You basically import your modules. We call these as modules. Um, so any component that you build has to extend from our standard module called Lightning Element. And then you import the Apex class. So for example, house service was an Apex class that we built. Get records was the method. So you actually can import that so that you can invoke that. So now with using this wire adapter, which is again a, a module, we can just call that. We can say get houses, and that will get all the houses here. right? Um, so now what we want to do here is, so this get houses will get us this information. It'll get all the house information. But if you look at the definition of the map marker, you need location, you need city, you need postal code and street. Um, so you need a lot of information and in a different format. So you have to transform your data, right? It's coming in a list format, but you have to transform that. And for that, you can use JavaScript. That's that's the best power of Lightning Web Components. You can use JavaScript. So basically, I'm going to copy some more lines here within this one. Um, so as you can see, let me format this, OK? Um, so where we can format this is format document. There you go. So I just formatted it. So I'll explain you what's happening. So with the wire adapter, right? I can say add wire and provide the method name of the Apex. So remember, your client, right, which is lighting component, is now calling Apex. And Apex is doing all the functionality. In this case, the Apex actually executed the soccer statement. The soccer statement is bringing all of the data from this house object, right? So what you can see is now it brought in all the data, and we can wire that to a method. And once we get the data, right, we map that data. So how many of you know JavaScript? If you know JavaScript, this is very easy. Like map function in JavaScript allows you to change the format of the data. So in this case, right, because my map function, like the map marker that uh, that is getting data from backend, has to get data in this form. Like it needs location. Um, so uh, you know, I'm able to like loop over this every data element that is coming and provide the location object, and then provide the title as a mark. And then if it is not error, then we want the error to be undefined. But if it is an error, we want the error, and we want the map marker to be undefined. Right? We can also get rid of this console logs, if you like. Uh, that's just for debugging. But yeah, this is how you build a lightning um, component. And then to expose that, we need to turn this flag to say true, so that it becomes available in my Salesforce environment uh, for admins. And then I want to provide a target. So in this case, my target is a simple home page because I told you I'm building this for the home page. All right, let's actually save all of these and then just save it to Salesforce. So again, deploy to Salesforce, deploy source to org. Now it's actually deploying to the org. So it just deployed, as you can see, it deployed fine. So now what you will see is we will have that component in our library. So I built that component as a as a developer, right? Now you will see in this custom component, you see this housing map now, right? This is what we built housing map with a powerful base component, right? So we didn't have to write code from the scratch. And then we have map markers. Um, map markers, we're getting the data from Apex, right? And then we are transforming that data using the map function, right? Um, in the same format that this marker was expecting, right? Uh, and then we expose this for 
our component. So now this component is available. Now what I can do is I can drag and drop that component. So let's go to the housing map. Let's drag and drop. I think it's better to drag and drop here. Save this. Right? Activate this. Uh, close this. So you see now all of the data that this house has, right? this list view that we saw we imported, now I'm able to show and change its format. Uh, you see now there's a map marker for all the five records that I have. I can click on that, I can view on them. Um, so this is, again, out of the box, we are able to create this experience, right? So think of it like for bigger apps, you can build, you can customize this user interface and build your own components. So think of it like creativity is only your limit here. You can think of anything that you want to build, you want to change, you want to design, you can do it in our in our Salesforce org by using these lightning web components. Okay, any questions? So that should conclude your um, the last module. And again, you know, something like this can be possible. Um, uh, you know, you see this is all built using Lightning Web Components. And I've given you uh, sufficient resources here for you to start learning Lightning Components. One of the very popular project is the LWC Recipes. So you uh, you bookmark something like Trailhead Apps. Let me open this in an incognito mode. So Trailhead Apps is where you can see a lot of our sample apps, like for example, e-bikes, recipes, cars, dream house, right? Ready to fly. So you, there's a lot of apps for you to learn how to build Salesforce apps. And then there is a lot of trailhead modules too that you can find where you can learn about these apps and see how you can build them. Uh, so so yeah, so that should conclude everything. Now I'll take some questions regarding LWC or whatever you have. Um, and again, remember like these slides I will share, um, but yeah, LWC is how you visualize your data. Um, I did not cover certain code aspects like flows and stuff. Um, but these are very, very easy to get started. And this slide, you would want to take a picture because here's how you get started. And then you can explore the full Dreamhouse sample app that we have. And then, um, you know, if you want to learn more about Lightning Web Components, then use the Lightning Web Component basic modules. All of this information, everything is on Trailhead. Uh, Trailhead, you'll find lots of resources, right, from beginner mindset to the experience one. So that's that should be your go-to resource for learning all of these. Thank you, Mohit. Um, I don't see any other questions um, written down. Okay. For anybody, do you, anyone has other questions related to the Lightning Web components, at least? Or any Salesforce related questions in general? If you want to talk about like what career opportunities we have, you know, I have like five to ten minutes where I can spend and uh, you know talk about it. Yeah. I don't I don't see any questions. Um, OK. Yeah. OK, one, I have uh, I have an earlier experience as a tech writer in IAM. Uh, can you can you expand what is IAM, Identity and Access Management? Um, I would love to know how can I explore in Salesforce, yes. Yeah, so again, as a tech writer, right, you want to, so again, Salesforce is very broad at this point. You want to explore like what you want to do with it, right? I mean, you want to get into the admin field or developer field, or you want to get into still writing, right? Um, yeah, so again, Trailhead is where you can get started, right? Uh, again, you have identity and access management experience. So I would say look into Salesforce docs to see uh, what identity and access management features that we provide and how uh, those docs are written. Um, again, you could be part of like an ISV company where you could be a writer of a product or something else, right? Um, so yeah, so it depends on what is your, uh, so yeah, as a dev architect, uh, path in, yeah. Yeah, so f identity and access management in Salesforce itself is a very big topic, actually. There is a, even a certification called uh, identity and access management uh, uh, you know, architect. So you can even become that. Yeah, you know, Again, you have to just understand what are the various offerings of the Salesforce in terms of identity, what are the tools that we give, um, 
and uh, yeah once you have that understanding and once you probably get the certification of like maybe salesforce developer plus an identity architect you can be an identity architect on your free, on uh, on salesforce platform too for various customers because all of these customers like enterprise customers they would need an architect with iam skills too I just got my admin credentials, but I have 15 years of experience teaching Java in a high school. So Apex seems like a good fit for me. Yes, uh, I think you're at home, actually. You know, I mean, 15 years of Java is probably like you just need a week of time with Apex and you're an expert already. Um, are there people who do both work as an admin or developer? Yes, definitely. I mean, there's this whole thing called consultants. Um, consultants uh, do whatever they they can do, so they do both admin, Salesforce development, uh, and even if you want to be a Salesforce developer, right, you will still walk through some of the admin concepts. So um, you know, just just as a developer, like the 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 key differences that I see between a Salesforce developer and an admin is. Uh, an admin usually maintains the Salesforce environment, right? He's more responsible for, you know, enabling users, activating them, uh, you know, monitoring Salesforce environment, doing the data uploads and things. While Salesforce developers are more geared towards building applications, and you can be a both. Yeah, can be a consultant. Which is better to use Visual Studio Code or a developer console as an IDE? Akilesh, thanks for the question. Actually, I would say use. Visual Studio Code, and we have a new product called Code Builder um, that will be launched, you know, some sometime uh, this year. Uh, with that, you know, the Developer Console is something that will go away eventually, and um, you know, we are moving towards this Visual Studio Code interface. Uh, only thing with Visual Studio is it requires you to install things on your machine, and when we have that Code Builder product. You can still have that Visual Studio experience right within the cloud, right within your org, without having to install anything. So I think that's one of the products that to look forward to. But uh, definitely, I would say move away from Developer Console if you can. Uh, can you provide your perspective on career prospect for Salesforce administrators? I've heard that many organizations are hiring developers uh, to perform both Salesforce administration and development tasks. Do you believe that knowledge of coding will be necessary skills for Salesforce administrators in the future? I wouldn't say so. Like, yeah, I mean. Um, for administrators, I don't think you need, uh, uh, you know, a real good coding skills, but it doesn't hurt to have some coding skills. Let's put it that way. Is there any roadmap to go through Trailhead? Can you share it with us if you don't mind? Yeah, so there is a roadmap. As you can see, there is a journey there um, as a developer. So there's a developer beginners um, guide. Uh, let me share with you that uh, developers. Beginner. So if you just search for develop beginner trailhead, right, it will give you um, a learning journey for you. Let's see. Uh, this is the one that I would say recommend. I'm just going to put it in the chat for you. Um, so this is a really nice trailhead module. So it has step by step of what you need to run, learn to become a developer. I would say, yeah, learn, you know, go by certifications. I usually tell people, like, you know, Initially, um, you know, it's better that you just learn through the certifications. Um, that would be a nice one, you know, to just learn through the the certification. Like go through first the admin cert and then the platform uh, builder, right? App builder, basically app builder, and then then move on to development. All right, uh, Darko, I think I'm running out of the time, and I think we have extensively covered uh, everything. Yeah. Um, uh, thank you, Mohit. You mentioned something maybe about rewards or something, or? What was that? About rewards, maybe. Uh, rewards? What's that? Yeah. Um, I mean, uh, you mentioned maybe like give a voucher or something to the members. Uh, no, not vouchers, but I, I said I'll give some resources, you know. Oh, yeah. Okay. Um, but uh, for the voucher, I'll have to. I'll have to work with my marketing to see if there is anything. But if there is anything, I'll definitely contact you. Uh, okay. But yeah, there's various resources that I wanted to share, and it will be in the slides that I'll share with you, Tarko. Perfect, perfect. Uh, thank you, Mohit. Um, so everyone who is in the group, uh, feel free to join the Salesforce Community Macedonia Facebook page and the admin group, which is on Trailhead. 
And thank you, Mohit, once again for spending time for us, like explaining the get, uh, get Started with Salesforce development. We, and I personally really appreciate it. Uh, your knowledge transfer is very important to everyone who was attending this uh, event. Thank you once again. Thank you, everyone. So have a great time, guys, and see you on the next event. Bye. Yeah, bye.